Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Vinay Lal, a very well-known historian, is with UCLA as well as with Delhi University in the past and now in dividing his time between Delhi and uh, California. Vinay, good to have you with us. Thank you for having me here. You have been writing a lot on Gandhi and contemporary politics, also a certain kind of critiques of different kind of movements that are taking place. How do you look at the current moment, particularly that you have movements spanning very different kinds of societies, very different kind of countries, from United States to Egypt to all over the place? Do you see this as, a, as something which is a new moment in our uh, history in terms of the kind of movements we are seeing? Yes, I mean, I, I think that this particular juncture is, uh, I think, in my view, a very significant moment in, uh, in, in contemporary history. Let's look at it, I think, this way, that you've had in the Arab world for about a year now a considerable amount of dissent, unrest, which has brought down a number of regimes, long-standing regimes with links largely to the American administration, Right. A couple of years before that, we had a movement in Iran, and there have been manifestations of that movement, in fact, this year as well. So I'm referring here to the so-called Green Movement, which uh, commenced in June of 2009. You've had substantial number of people gathering together in places like Israel. There have been demonstrations on a very large scale, obviously, in parts of Europe, where we have a different set of so-called crises. I say so-called because there's always a crisis, it seems to be, somewhere around, somewhere, right? And I'm not quite sure how meaningful that word is anymore, frankly, in the English language. But nevertheless, there have been large demonstrations in Athens, uh, in Madrid, in Barcelona. Indignance. And then, of course, we've had the Occupy Wall Street, you know, which has now branched off in the U.S. into a hundred different movements, right? I mean, perhaps all rivulets feeding into one stream, I think that that also remains to be seen whether that's the case because I think very, very often what happens with movements of this kind is that there are different agendas. I mean, so we can say that in the case of the U.S. So let's look just for a moment at the U.S. and then we'll go back to the Middle East or to West Asia, right? But if you look at the U.S., I, I think that it would be correct to say that, yes, there's been one kind of rhetorical drive that seems to unify all of these different movements. Some of them have taken place on university campuses, of course, on Wall Street, some of them in cities such as Oakland, right? And, and that divide has been usually represented as a divide between the 99% and the 1%, right? So that might be perhaps common to all of them. But, but I'm absolutely certain because I think that's the nature of social movements, that once you go deep down into a study of each of these, you'll find that they might also be driven by agendas that might not be completely congruent with each other, right? So there may be different agendas in different cities, which may nonetheless share something in common, right? Now, if you go back to, the, to, the, to West Asia, uh, and I think that that's where we really ought to be focusing our attention on for, for many for many reasons. One of those reasons being that I think the West has always thought that it was the, the motor of history, right? That, you know, the West would sort of dictate what would happen or that if there were revolutions occurring elsewhere in the world, they would emulate what had happened in the West. I, I think here we have actually a reversal. I mean, you've got the Green Movement, which commenced in Iran in June 2009. And I think that this is an extraordinarily significant movement I think the ramifications of which have not been clearly understood, whether in India or in the U.S. or indeed elsewhere, uh, partly because I think it would be impossible to say that this was driven by external agents. But one point could also be considered common in the sense that there is a very large degree of alienation from the kind of neoliberal economic policy and the consequence of the politics has become in some sense 
bypassed, that countries no longer control the politics of their countries yes. because the economics is not in con their hands. Yes. Now, in that sense, isn't it a, in that sense, isn't there a common crisis of the neoliberal order yes. which manifests itself as a political crisis? That's one way to look at it, you know. Uh, although I suspect that that kind of paradigm has been available for us to think through for a very long period of time. In other words, I think that, you know, that when you look at these political disturbances, we would have to ask, well, were there forms of economic injustice that had driven these political agendas, right? I mean, so let, if, you, if you look, let's say, just for a moment, okay, uh, let's supposing you look at the, uh, at the time that the Cold War ended, you know, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, um, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the breakup of the Warsaw Pact, all of that. Now, clearly, I think, I mean, that, you know, you could read it purely as a political, okay, set of events. But clearly, there is some aspiration, and maybe the left may not want to hear it in that way, frankly, but there was some aspiration for economic justice as well, because if you're living on the other side of the wall and you're seeing what's happening in West Germany, I mean, you can see the clear divide between yourself and the people over there. You can see the divide in the standard of living, so forth and so on. Sure, right? the okay. difference of standards of living yeah. obviously was a driver in yeah. the fall of the uh, Soviet Absolutely. Union and but the Absolutely, but I think that you're, you're right on target here when you're suggesting that, that one of the things that perhaps is common to all of these movements, whether they are in West Asia or in Europe or the US, um, you know, whether in fact, for a moment, just hypothetically, we could put something like the movement in India, the so-called Annazare movement in that camp, which some people would say, well, it's some kind of manifestation of popular unrest. But I think if you leave that aside and you look at certainly what's happened in Israel, Europe, West Asia, and so on, and the US, uh, I think you're right that uh, there is a, a deepening sense of uh, anguish, okay, and unrest about the aggravation of economic injustice under neoliberal regimes, right? And the fact that whoever yeah. you elect seem to be completely powerless to control yes. what is happening. So yeah. in that sense, if you see yes. that whoever, each of the countries have seen, for instance, one set of incumbents go out and another set come yeah. in, but the yeah. policies haven't really changed. And that is the deeper yeah. right. anger against the political system per se. In the case of yes. Egypt, of course, Mubarak, uh, there was not even a change of guard in yeah. that sense earlier. For right. 40 years, you were the same people. Yes, yeah. But, but, you know, I think by the same token, we would have to understand that, I mean, there have been critiques of this neoliberal regime. Uh, there have been critiques of the WTO. I mean, what was Chiapas all about, for example? I mean, Chiapas was the, one of the first rebellions, really, of this kind, in a way. And it, it broke out right after NAFTA, North American uh, Free Trade Agreement. So I, I think if you, if you look at you know, the long trajectory of this, I think clearly there have been movements of this kind over the course of the last two decades. What is, what is significant and perhaps different is the fact that now they seem to be occurring in many places around the world. But they signify not only a sense of deepening economic injustice and the sense of grievance that one might have about it, but I think they signify also something about the fact that Politics, as we understand it, is perhaps a different game now than it has been before, by which I mean a number of different things. One is that I think that there is a peculiar way in which politics has been evacuated of any real meaning. So if you look at the U.S., I mean, for 150 years, the U.S. has been magisterially successful in masquerading as a country with two significantly different political parties. In point of fact, there is no real significant difference between these two parties. I mean, it's basically Tweedledee and Tweedledum. The point here simply is this, that I think in the US, it's very clear that we've really not had an opportunity to understand politics in any significant sense other than party politics, okay? Now, I think the ground reality, let's say in India, let's shift to India for a moment and then we'll shift to, the, to West Asia. I think in India, the same argument might be made by some people who'll say that, well, there's no substantive difference between, let's say, the BJP and the CPM and the Congress with respect to policies on neoliberalization. Now, of course, I mean, one could argue that uh, 
you know, uh, but if you certainly look at the way in which f direct foreign investment is being welcomed in, in West Bengal, okay, when it was under the CPM in the last few years, to some would indicate the fact that there is no significant difference. On the other hand, clearly the ground realities of how the CPM worked, I think are very different, in fact, actually, right? I think there is still actually significant differences in how one, it, significant differences not simply between political parties, but between parties and what might, one might describe as other kinds of political interests, which have a significant impact on how politics is run in this country. And the obvious example would be obviously, you know, the so-called Naxals, uh, who have political representation to some degree, but they're also those who don't have political representation, right? So what I'm trying to suggest is this, that I think one of the um, most unfortunate things about our times, and I think this is where I think there's a glimmer of hope now in what we see happening in West Asia and in the U.S. and elsewhere. One of the most unfortunate things is that Politics has really been evacuated of most of its meaning, okay? And so what you're seeing now, particularly in West Asia, is the resuscitation of a kind of politics which really does allow people some kind of voice, where people say that they're going to take things into their own hands. Now, one might add some caveats to it because then one might say that, okay, let's look at what's happened in Egypt where, okay, Mubarak was overthrown and yet the situation seems to be fairly dire even today, right? But I think that we have to measure these things not, in, not with respect to how they unfold over a course of three months or six months or one year, but I think over the course of how they unfold over the course of several years, maybe a decade or two decades. Vinay, I think that's a know. very important point to make, that yeah. I think that one of it is that the crisis of politics, that even you had the right to elect your leaders, yes. India, whether it's India, whether it's the United States or it's Europe, yeah. and you change them didn't make a difference to exact the policies on the ground, particularly economic policies. That's yes. one part of it. The second, as you said, that if particularly to looking at West Asia, the ability of the people to change the pol the policies by being able to come on the streets and raising issues, raising demands, yes. and directly influencing politics. Now, the problem, of course, there is that ultimately. Even today, yes. the only instrument of politics finally that we really see is still the nation state. Yes. So effectively, whatever you may do on the street, yeah. if it does not translate into politics of the nation state, you still do not get the politics you want. Yes. And Egypt could yeah. be an example yeah. of that kind. Yeah. So yeah. where do you think does it mean that how do you really think that street can influence ultimately the politics of nations yeah. without being an ele electoral or a political player in that sense? Yeah, yeah. well, th that's a very difficult question. I mean, it's a very difficult question because, uh, uh, you know, you put your finger on what is a critical problem with the nature of modern political movements, which is that, you see, we are all captive to the idea of the nation state. The nation state is, seems to be this seems to represent the apotheosis of political possibilities, right? I mean, what is it that the Palestinians want at the end of the day? They want a nation state. But the fact of the matter is, at least from the, pol from the political point of view that I am firmly convinced about, namely that the nation state is in fact, in most respects and in most places, the most severe oppressor of human rights. Right, so, so all your aspirations are geared towards this. I mean, this is what the Palestinians want. This is what the Basques wanted, right? Uh, this is what separatist movements want. They eventually want their own nation state. And then the nation state in turn becomes the vehicle of forms of oppression, which cannot be managed in any sense of the term, right? And managed is not the right word because I don't, because we don't certainly want to manage them in the way in which nation state have managed their conflicts, right? Uh, so I think that th this problem will persist, namely that, you know, s for the last two centuries, the only game in town effectively has been the nation state, right? So each freedom movement, its culmination is something called the nation state. And so uh, the way that I would pose the question you're asking, I mean, if I had to rephrase it, would be, you know, what are the real possibilities 
political possibilities? What are the possibilities for emancipation, for economic justice, so long as what we are working with is something called the nation state? Right? Now, I think that that, as I said, is a very difficult question because, in a sense, the nation state is a fait accompli. I mean, that's what we have. So what we would then have to think about is, well, are there different ways to forge notions of political community, you know, right? Um, and does West Asia, for example, promise us something in this respect? And at the moment, the answer would be no, because what's interesting is that, you know, that you've got these rebellions that have broken out, uh, obviously, in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Bahrain, right, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's not clear that the people involved in these are really thinking about the transgression of boundaries and borders, right?